Support for Podcast by Night is provided by Midnight Syndicate. To learn more, visit midnightsyndicate.com. Welcome back, everybody, to Podcast by Night. I'm your host, John Long. I'm Jennifer Wolf. And joining us once again is Logan. Thank you so much for joining us. This is going to be fantastic. Uh, we, as you heard on a previous podcast, uh, Logan said the Malkavians are one of his absolute favorite clans. And guess what we're covering tonight? We're covering Malkavians, aren't we? We are. We are. <laughs> Yay! Oh, he's a happy boy. At least somebody's excited. <laughs> No, no, the Malks are fantastic. I know. I love playing Malkavians. I have had the most fun playing some Malkavians, so you won't hear me hating on, on Malkavians, but I do have to give Logan a hard time. Oh, feel free, feel free. Believe me, you're not going to be the first and not going to be the last. The Malkavians are easily abused, and I'm sure we'll get to talk about that. I think we do. We do. Uh, yeah, I, as in, in my reading of all the... Uh, the, these wonderful mad men of the kindred and and women, what they fall under the low clans, and there's like a we're gonna get to that too. But it's kind of like I, I really feel bad for these guys. They get all dumped on and stuff. But I digress. I mean, when it comes to the heart of it, John, there is a fine line between sanity and insanity. It's all a matter of perspective, and what the high clans may consider as being insanity may not be nearly as crazy as you would think that's true that's true uh, i believe a wise man once said that madness is next to the divine well that ma- wise man could have been crazy too but that wise man was most definitely crazy <laughs> well i mean obviously it's like like who else would come up with something to make you sound better <laughs> but you know when you think about sanity the definition of it is what is sane is only sane because everyone else has come together and said that this is a baseline definition of what sane is. And anything outside of that narrow definition, it must be insane. But sometimes you just have to kind of look at the world a little differently. You, You just have to shift your perspective just a hair to the right or to the left to see things that others fail to notice because they're so concerned with being in that narrow box of sanity. And... Frankly, that's what Clan Malkavian is all about. Definitely. The, uh, the, the Clan of Madness, Clan of the Moon, they definitely excel at the idea of not really just not toying with your perspectives, but also trying to, I don't know, they have a reputation for sort of being tricksters. So some people might misjudge them or mislabel them as, you know, just, oh, let's not take life too seriously, like a court jester or something. But it definitely goes deeper than that. You see, that's part of the uh, problem people have with them is they think they're disruptive and they can be because they've got an in-universe reason to be disruptive because within their uh, clan flaw, they've got the madness, of course. And so many people will just take that as license to do whatever. All right. So as we usually do, we start with as far as we can at the beginning. Because, you know, with anything that we've learned thus far with the Kindred, their histories are mired in lore, legend, myth, with just maybe, maybe a kernel of truth to it. Um, And it all depends on the clan and and how seriously they take it. And the Malkavians are no exception, because very little is known of their ancient history. But we all, I guess they all agree on that their clan progenitor's name was Malkav. In theory, that's what they say their clan progenitor's name was. Um, and most people accept that. There's some suggestion that Malkov is, he is not dead, that uh, that he's off somewhere. He's hiding either, he's in either in torpor or he's existing in the consciousness of the mutual madness that all the Malkavians share. I like that one. It's the cobweb. Yeah, it's not clear what is up with Malkov. Whatever the case is, it's agreed that every he himself and everyone in his line had just a a little kooky way of looking at the world that they're in many ways the uh a reflection of society and all its anxieties and all of its 
spheres and that Malkov was able to, through that uh, dark reflection, kind of see visions and he could speak it was said he could see visions and speak to the gods. He could hear the voice of spirits and you know, all those things that you kind of associate with the early uh, religions of humankind. Malkov, Malkov and his children sort of get associated with. So if you think about like the ancient zir- ziggurats and temples of ancient societies, the, the, the soothsayers and the prophets and the oracles, these were all manned by people who said they could hear the voice of the gods and that they could see truths in like, you know, lamb livers. Uh, I, I'm very fond of my, my Romans. My Rom- uh, as you know, my Romans were very big into oracles and auguries. And so if like a bird pooped on your head, it meant <laughs> good luck or something. Um, but it, it, there are these people who are seeing these signs and wonders in the world. And that's, what the Malkavians, the Malkavians have tapped into that. Right. Yeah. It's no wonder that ancient history is just steeped with those soothsayers and those oracles that, you know, these legends that we, that we still talk about today, like you said, with Rome and of course, uh, Greece with Delphi, you know, we always try to say that there was some sort of scientific reason for it, like the vapors from the volcano, but it could have just been <laughs> the Malkavian. You know, maybe maybe they were all ghouls of, a, of the, the headmistress was a Malkavian and she passed it on. It was, you know, who knows? Who knows? Probably maybe even some of the very gods that they thought they were worshiping and the very gods they thought were talking to them in the guts of whatever lamb they slaughtered were Malkavians. Absolutely. That's another great thing you hit on there, Jen. Like back in the ancient times, a lot of their gods were human sized. You know, they, they looked like people. They just had extraordinary abilities. So who's to say? That's also when you have the uh, first kind of fae like beings involved. And initially, in the earlier editions, Malkavians were tied fairly heavily to the fae. They had ways into Arcadia and could phase in and out of reality. And reality busting quote-unquote, was a big thing in Malkavian culture. And what's better to bust reality than to convince people you control it? And that leads us into, from ancient times into the Dark Ages, where it's just a whole other, you know, ball of wax, a kettle of fish that the Malkavians find themselves in. We go from being gods to madmen, fools, and jesters. Yeah, I mean, in the ancient times, the Malkavians were given respect. You know, you are you're seeing visions from the gods, But once you get into the Dark Ages, especially in Europe, especially where there is only one God and there is only one church, anyone who kind of deviated from this accepted worldview was kind of seen as crazy. And anyone who would have been seen as being touched by the gods or touched by the spirits, now they're kind of seen with fear and suspicion because... Just a little touched in the head. They're a little touched in the head. Obviously, it's demons. Got to be demons because it's that's the go-to. If it's if it's weird and kooky, demons. Yeah, or you know, like Logan said, if you're out in the wilds, you're fey touched. Oh, fey. Well, we all know fey are demons. Come on. I mean, that's just that's in the that's all in, the, in all the witchcraft books, right? Is it? Well, if it's in a witchcraft book, then it is demons. <laughs> it's got to be true. That's right. Oh, the Fae are a conversation for another day, and I'm happy to go into that there. But as they relate to Malkavians, it really is just the um, the madness that both of them have, the otherness, the alien, the outside of society that they inhabit. They uh, push at the boundaries. And when you're controlled by a church with, as you said, that very narrow mindset, you don't want anyone pushing those boundaries. They might find things that have questions you can't answer, and you don't want to not be able to answer questions. No, no, because, you know, unanswered questions might, you know, go against the standard order of society and procedure, and that's just not sane. Of course not. That's insane. And, you know, this all comes back to, uh, well, the Bruja would call it karma for Carthage. The Malkavians themselves would, uh, well... Depending on the one, they might give you a long diatribe about Carthage or start babbling incoherently. Remember Carthage? <laughs> I always remember Carthage every day. That's right. From the Dark Ages, you know, and all their superstitions and huddling around the firelight, definitely starts to 
pegged them a little bit more as those crazy kooks or possessed beings that the church might find to take an interest in. But then with the dawning of the Renaissance and Enlightenment and the Age of Reason, things start to take a different tack for uh, the Malkavians. Well, before that, though, we should probably clarify that in the Dark Ages, that's when Clan Malkavian gets pegged with the low clan uh, label that the Venture and the Toreador like to like pin on them. Because they're, they are crazy, at least in the Venture and Toreador's mind. The Venture and Toreador are also terrified of them. They don't want them to have power because after Ventru, Malkavians were once one of the highest population of princes there was because they had that extra knowledge pulled from somewhere. God, their madness, the cobweb, fairies. But the problem is, is the Malkavians, because of their inability to fit into the box that the Ventru and Toreador and other high, so-called high clans wanted to, wanted to start creating... That's when they get slapped with this label of you're a low clan. You, you you can't be trusted in polite society. You know, you're too... Also, too... Never know what's going to come out of their mouth. You never know what's going to come out of their mouth. Can't have them talking these awkward truths in front of the king, the prince. And worse, because they go out there, they shoot their mouth off because they're saying the crazy thing. And now the humans are, are in an uproar. And then they start killing off... All these vampires, because Malkavians have to go and shoot their mouths off. So Malkavians start increasingly being seen by the so-called proper society of vampires as being a problematic clan. And this is why they get labeled as a low clan by everybody else. As a player note, I would like to say that uh, any time that we discuss something within like the low clan, we speak of low clans or high clans, it is something that comes through in your role play. Because in this time, the Dark Ages is the gateway to the modern knights. Every prejudice, everything that you think that, you know, society says is correct. Like Jen said, this the thing that builds the box started getting built here. So everything, every time you have a social interaction with anybody, well, not anybody, but most people at a game, especially if you're in Scylla or Neonate, these are the prejudices you're going to be dealing with. Yeah. And so, especially if you get older vampires, they're going to be kind of snotty about some of these things. The reason they're snotty is these are prejudices that if they didn't inherit because they were there, they have it's been passed down to them because their sire was there. Right. And they just, you know, it was all hearsay. Exactly. Okay. So now we're stepping out of the Dark Ages. Yes. Into the Renaissance. But why? They were such fun. Lots of lunatic asylums and other places no no but now we have the age of reason we uh, we we understand their madness a little more but your age of reason i say (laughs) well once you get that shift from this idea of an existential center of the universe and say the form of god to a internal human focused understanding of the world then uh, the idea of madness shifts too because no longer is madness like being touched by the gods or the fae or the demons or what have you it's actually seen as as being a product of something internal if you're a calvinist you might say it's because you are internally a sinful creature if you are a psychologist you could say internally it is because you suffer from mental health disabilities but it's that shift at this at the time of the renaissance and the enlightenment malkavians go from being touched by some exterior power beyond themselves giving them insight and it's now seen as something broken and faulty within themselves and their own mind and body and spirit. You're absolutely right. And the Malkavians were pretty happy with that because, hey, they're not looking at us anymore. What can we accomplish now? Except the Inquisition was looking at them. And, I mean, the Inquisition was already looking for reasons to start hunting down people. But... The combination of both the Inquisition and the Anarch Revolts, it just sort of made a a situation for the Malkavians that was soon becoming untenable. 
they couldn't just be the roaming people in the countryside spouting their visions anymore. They couldn't be the uh, crazy people who are just pushing against the boundaries of society because now the Inquisition is hunting them down. The Inquisition proved to be disastrous for the Malkavians. And that is because of their gifts and their insight. Because, frankly, their ability to see the world in weird, wonderful, and offbeat ways it tends to creep the fuck out of people. And um, when you are so odd and so strange and so different, that's going to put a big target on you. And the Malkavians soon were being targeted by people like the Inquisition. And you'd, you'll find that the Inquisition was often digging up the random Malkavian neonate or fledgling who could who was exhibiting madness of some sort. And then suddenly you got a Malkavian tiki torch going on for you. I mean, the Inquisition was dangerous for Malkavians. Well, it's hard to blend in, especially when you're young and you don't know what's going to trigger you. You don't know what's going to make your madness pop and... You just kind of got to hide with the other crazy people and hope you don't stand out or hope they're not willing to torch a whole mass of crazy people. Unfortunately, they were. Unfortunately. And this is why the Malkavians, despite the fact that they're seen as a quote unquote low clan, joined with the Camarilla. Yeah, I wanted to just tag on that the, the that bit there. We were talking about how they stand out. And again, with the low clan thing is that it's. I'm also starting, you know, we talked about the gang role, and it, I'm starting to see a trend in the idea of what a low clan is. It tends to be those, it's not just that you're like low born, it's also, you could be a, a, a liability. So the like the Ventru and the, the Bruja, the ones that can sort of stand up and blend in, definitely are like, no. It's also the idea of having political cachet. Uh, Ventru Obviously, we'll have political cachet because that's what they deal in. But a Malkavian, depending, it depends on Malkavian to Malkavian. If you have a Malkavian whose insanity allows them to function at a fairly normal level, they may be able to play the game. But if you have a Malkavian whose uh, whose insanity is really debilitating, they're not going to be able to. So that's also part of the problem is these low clans have things about them that don't allow them to have the same kind of quote unquote sway as some of these other clans. And that's where the low and the high come from. It's an all, it's an arbitrary line that gets decided by the people who are the haves against the people who are the have nots. And it's interesting that you bring up the Bruja there because a Bruja with his quickness to frenzy is going to be just as disruptive as any Malkavian is going to be and just as easy to spot and just as much of a liability. Which is why the Bruja are considered a low clan now. They are now, but in the Middle Ages. Exactly. They weren't. And with, and like you said, with the forming of the Camarilla and the Malkavians joining this new sect, it's trying to see you know, their, their, their leadership, as such as it is, see it as a sort of protection for you know if they're lacking their own this is another way of i i, I kind of like the I, the idea that the the high clans that sort of set the bar have now have serfs in a new sort of fiefdom under the title of you know hey we're the society of friends we're going to help protect each other but you're going to do what i say yeah they're not the quakers john <laughs> they're not not not, not that no, yeah, not okay, friends, boss. but you know what i mean the camaria yeah, I mean, it, there is that certain aspect of the Camry is supposed to be about mutual protection and cooperation, but only on the terms of a certain handful of elders and clans and everyone else. Just you have to learn how to behave yourself or we're going to exclude you from our cool kids club, essentially. Conform or die. Conform or die. And that hit the Malkavians harder than any of them because they gave up their discipline for it. Yeah, they did. And so this is kind of one of the running themes for uh, s for several of these clans is the fact that you gave up your gifts as a vampire. You gave up your freedom, essentially, to join the Camarilla for protection from the Inquisition and what was coming in those dark nights. And it cost you something in doing it. For the gang girl, it cost them a lot of their freedom. For the Malkavians, it cost them a lot of their insight and their unique view of the world because they couldn't 
indulge in it anymore without getting caught. And how sad is it that what it cost them was an integral piece of their already ethereal sense of self? Exactly. Now, we were saying that with the Renaissance and the Age of Reason, that the opinions on insanity and that what what causes you know the the brain and diseases of the brain um, cultivated they a sense of if one society like mortal society has a deeper understanding that's going to filter into kindred society and so they're not, they may still be mistrusted by the Camarilla but they're not going to be as marginalized once those ideas filter in too. The good thing about human society during the Renaissance and the Age of Enlightenment shifting its its mindset about madness. The good thing that came out of that is Malkavians are not nearly as feared in some ways as they used to be. When it was an existential madness, you could always be like, oh, it's the gods or demons or what have you. But now human society is starting to think of it in more humane terms. And Malkavians, realizing they needed to protect themselves started to kind of start cultivating that idea like yeah human society go on thinking that it's you know uh, it's a disease or you know what have you so because that offers the Malkavians protection so you start seeing Malkavians who are very involved in what we now see what we now call as the mental health field so they're involved in scientific research or they're encouraging the development of asylums as a humane way to deal with mental health issues or they're involved in psychology or psychiatry um all these new emerging fields that we start seeing coming out in the 19th and 20th century because now that's changing society's perception of what madness is and once society's perception of what madness is changes that gives them a certain protection surrounding their particular gift. Because who knows better the power of perception than the one whose perception is utterly broken. And in that, with the foster, you know, not only did the Malkavians find a home, we, you know, as, as we said, the, in the mental health field, but also with this burgeoning sense of, of uh, perspective and, and how it can be shifted or altered, they also found a new home in what would be considered hedonistic cultures in the western in the west western cultures such as artists and rebels and the avant-garde they it, it was like they found some mortals that sort of understood them yeah it's not just the toreadors who like to hang out and you know amongst the bohemians of society um Malkavians can be you know live in the bohemian life too the vibo um they are they're often found in those kind of cultures because those are the cultures that are the most accepting of people with different perspectives and alternate perspectives so if there's a Malkavian who's dropping profound but utterly confusing statements they're just going to be like yeah man that's so deep that's so deep they were big in the beat era they're so big in the beat era they were bigger in the era of of um, uh, abstraction <laughs> Dali, if not a Malkavian or influenced by one, would have been one of their favorites. Oh, they would have loved him. I'm not. I'm, you can't convince me he might not have been a Malkavian. Yeah, I was gonna say if if he you know wasn't, he is now. <laughs> but those kind of, of societies are much more accepting of the Malkavians and their unique bent on the world than than say a boardroom or a drawing room or a salon, those places are going to be like, oh, look, they're acting crazy again. Quick, throw a sheet over it. And let's pretend it's not happening. But, you know, you go to the artist corner and, you know, there's people who are tripping on all sorts of things. So what's one more person tripping? I mean. Yeah. I mean, that definitely sounds some like something they would have been at the forefront of. What are you on? And more importantly, where can I get some? Exactly. I that somewhere. Exactly. At a time when there are a lot of chemical aids going on like you know opium or you know marijuana or what have you obviously a lot of people were were having lots of strange visions and seeing things drop a tab of acid and you'll probably sound just like a malkavian and speaking of acid and lsd this obviously starts sounding like we're getting close to the modern knights with this clan these poor guys they're still they're still fighting for acceptance i mean i don't know what's going on with the cam but uh I don't know about fighting. I think a lot of them have happily accepted that they just aren't going to be understood 
And at least these people aren't burning us. And honestly, the modern nights in many ways is probably the best time period for the Malkavians because those strange quirks, they're almost a badge of honor nowadays, especially in our modern post, well, I say modern as in current, but like, especially in postmodern society, it, it now everybody is allowed to have their own perspective and their own point of view. So every point of view is accepted or understood or, you know, there's a place for everyone here at the table. So the Malkavians and their weirdness is just yet another point of view. Let's just accept the fact that guy over there is fairly certain he's been abducted by aliens. You know what? Everybody's got their own unique way of looking at the world. Okay, look, aliens don't exist. That's just the Fae playing tricks on you. You know what? You go tell that to Fox Mulder. That's all I have to say about the subject. You know, if I could, I would. <laughs> oh, Fox. Well, they're still little and gray. <laughs> Reticulans. Oh, God. Okay, well, but certainly. I mean, that yes, that does make sense, even though their reputation still points them. You know, fin- They're still seen as, as troublesome because even though they may find more acceptance in the modern era of, oh, you know, perception is reality, their, their own inborn flaw, if you will, still doesn't give them the ability to operate within Camarilla society. They, they can't seem to get past that even now. I, I wouldn't say they can't operate in Camarilla society. No, no, I meant in, in, in the way like the high clans do. Like the, like some Ventru is not going to be like, Psh, yeah, you're not my Seneschal. Yeah, the Malkavians are still treated with a certain amount of wariness. And they do still have a certain amount of difficulty as you, to forming a united front politically. Though certainly they can if they want to. Uh, the, the fear much more with the Malkavians is their unpredictability. What will they do if you cross them? What will they do if you, if they really want to just fuck around with your life? And so because of that, the Camarilla is a little, they handle the Malkavians very carefully. You, you don't want, you, you, they still look down upon them, but they also don't want to cross them because if you piss them off they could really make your life difficult in some really not comfortable ways also anytime more than three malkavians gather in one place everyone else gets a little worried yeah i mean the the clan does have a reputation of being troublesome they love to upset the status quo i mean this is a clan who they all see the world just a little differently so they think you should see the world just this differently too. They're not trying to upset the status quo. They're trying to take the wool from your eyes. Each and every one of them is convinced that what they see is the truth, except the ones who think they're crazy, but we don't talk about them. They're just trying to bring you up to their level. What's wrong with that? Unfortunately, not everyone takes as enlightened a view of the Malkavian perspective and their logic. So there's many a Malkavian that has found themselves on the wrong end of the prince's wrath for a joke that may have gone a bit too far um, or, you know, a prank that really may have been carried out, out to an unfortunate end. And so because of that, the Malkavians have suffered a little bit reputation wise, but there has been many a situation where a kindred has also found themselves roped into a situation that looks pretty damn incriminating because a wily Malkavian figured out a way to make that happen. And because of their chaotic nature, as, as we've stated before, that they don't really find themselves into what, what kindred society would consider true leadership positions. But, and this is something I didn't know, that there is actually a, a Malkavian prince that, what, Quentin King of Boston? is. Do we know that if he's currently still prince? As far as I know, I mean, I... I haven't seen anything contradicting it. Yeah, I haven't seen anything that has changed that. And he's been prince of Boston for a long time. Yeah, so, you know, it is possible. There are cities and places where there are more are Malkavians who can rise in power. That said, the, it's pretty rare. It's 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 very rare. In the modern nights, it's rare. Yeah. As individuals, many may be seen as silly, clueless, even childish. Um, but here's the thing about the Malkavians. Their power isn't in the singular person who may or may not be able to grasp a princedom. Their power actually lies in the fact that they, when they're a united front, you don't want to mess with that. You, they can be absolutely 
devastating as a united front. So this allows the Malkavians to have a little bit of, of, of sway in the Camarilla because as I said, the, the Camarilla tr treats them very warily. They know that if you cross a Malkavian, they can make your life very difficult. If, now imagine if they got all their Malkavian brothers and sisters in on the joke too. Then that, that's bad news. There is one theory that the Malkavian Madness Network, the cobweb, it's not uh, Malkov. It's not – their insight does come from it, but the cobweb is just the sum total of every Malkavian ever. Anything any one of them knows, another of them can access. Which we'll get into more in a little bit, but – yeah, I mean, it's that fact that all of them together can, they communicate with each other. And they, if you piss one off, you might as well be pissing the whole damn clan off. Because they will make your life miserable. You know, and on the flip side of that, if you're smart enough that to rally the Malkavians, then you've got a force to be reckoned with on your side. Whoever you, you know, whoever you are, like a prince of a city or the, the, yes. a primogen of another clan that's like, hey, I got an agenda. I'm going to push it. I got some Malkavian friends. And so that means that, you know, the Malkavians, they can play the game if they choose. And they're very capable of it and well aware of how the game is played. They just have to choose to play it. Well, now that we've spoken about their, a little bit about their history and their place in the Camarilla, let's talk about their culture and how, how their clan culture or self-identity is with the, uh, with the Malkavian. Because, I mean, if you ask one you know, quote unquote, typical Malkavian. Hey, what's your clan's culture like? I mean, you know, sit down and break out a pen and paper because you're going to get like five different answers. Yeah, I don't think there's any one cohesive answer to that. I think they all think their clan culture is something that is different. Some of them are like, we have a culture. Honestly, it's not like the clan really has a quote unquote clan structure. Not in the sense that you, you would find in the Venture or the Tremere, who have very strict cultures, it's it's just Malkavian. <laughs> well, you see, every once in a while, you happen to have a bunch of them show up together, and just nobody's really sure or going to tell you why. And they're there, they're going to do some stuff, they're going to talk about some stuff. It's not going to make sense to anyone else, it's probably not going to make sense to most of them. And then they're going to leave, and everyone around them is going to look around and worry for years to come. That's that's probably true. It's true. And no one will know what's no one will know what that was about. But in some cities, you know, when you have older Malkavians that have been around for a while, they tend to be a lot more relaxed with their insanity. They they've definitely been around, they know how to control things, they have they they under, they kind of serve as the de facto leaders within a city or or possibly mentors uh depending on where they are and how you know who who they are. I always saw it more as protectors. These are the guys who pop up like Professor X and say, you've got some trouble, my dear. You appear to be completely insane. Let me show you how to isolate your trigger and not let it happen, because otherwise you're going to greet the dawn. Well, that would be ideal. Yeah, in terms of a clan structure, such as it is, and you don't see me by making the quote marks, such as it is, <laughs> Malkavians tend to build relationships with each other rather than having any formal ties of sire and child or you know it's it's much more that they build bonds together and look out for each other and sometimes those are sire and child relationships and sometimes it may just be a group of them who've all kind of just gravitated to each other and they all just kind of look out for each other and understand each other's crazy essentially so on the outside it looks like it's a group brought together for companionship What's really going on be below the surface? Who knows? One can never be sure what their what their motivations are for why you get a group of them who've all kind of bonded together. Beyond that, the Malkavians don't seem to really have a true organization. At least you can't see it at first because there's there's some things working underneath the surface that sort of they might have it might have been what brought them together to begin with. It might have been you, you know just some sort of feeling i need i need to go to los angeles i just feel compelled to be there and it, uh, when you do a deeper dive it you, you, it starts to show that the malkavians indeed have a highly structured and organized way of of doing things that we're just not aware of we being non-malkavians and the way they do that is through the aforementioned malkavian madness network or otherwise known as the cobweb Logan, do you want to speak into that a little bit more? Well, I've spoken a little bit about it beforehand. Um, it's 
a connection between Malkavians. The working theories are that, well, the legendary behind it, if you're looking into the Book of Nod, is that when Malkov was struck down, all of his children gathered around to this corpse and lapped up his blood, thus as a clan diablerizing their sire, accepting him into themselves, and turning him into what is now called as the Madness Network. The yum, Cobbler. yum. Slurp. But another working theory is, like I said earlier, it's a collective consciousness. It's this cloud of thoughts that just get put up there continuously by Malkavians, and any of them can pull down anything that's up there. They just don't always have control over what it is. And the best seers among them are the ones with the control to, I need this piece of information, I'm going to go dive for it. Um, beyond that, it's actually a bit like, uh, honestly, the first Malkavian who heard about the internet probably wanted to sue for copyright. Now, from my understanding, though, it's not like it's telepathy. It, it could show up in any number of ways. Yeah, it's not so direct most of the time. Again, it's not, uh, it's not consistent among the clan, just like the rest of it. It's, it's crazy. <laughs> There's no other way to put it. It's utter madness. It's a jumble. It's half legend, half truth, and half insanity. It's just there among the Malkavians, and it's really hard to quantify. I love that there's three halves in there that somehow are supposed to make a whole because only a Malkavian would think like that. Exactly. <laughs> but, you know, they say that in this Malkavian Madness Network that you can find the memories of Malkavians both alive and dead. You can find the consciousness of maybe Malkavians who are long gone. You can find maybe Malkov. Maybe he's hanging around in there doing his kooky thing. Who knows? Well, like I said, the theory, one of the theories, the most prominent one, is that it is the remnants of Malkov. It is essentially his corpse. But the uh, thing of it is, yeah, there have been reports, stories within that you can go and talk to what remains of a consciousness of a long dead Malkavian. But the thing of it is, the longer they're in there, the further back that they uploaded themselves to that madness network the more exposed to it they've become and the less coherent they are. They have all the knowledge in the world, but they can't say it because they are just so far gone. Hence the broken mirror. Every piece is beautiful, shiny, beyond all belief, but it's still frigging broken. And is it true that there are elders who are so adept at it that they can use it to manipulate other Malkavians if they wanted to? I can't confirm that. I can't deny that because if I did, somebody would take it back later and possibly through my mouth. <laughs> I I only say that because there is some who say that some of uh, some of the clan ancients hide there, or and they're just waiting to download their personalities into other people, you know. Um, which I don't know. That sounds an awful lot like diablery to me, but uh. psychic diablery. God help us. <laughs> Ooh. Oh, God, that's creepy as hell. That is. And the Malkavians are the ones who could pull it off. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Think about that. Think about how terrifying that would be. You've got this Malkavian fledgling over here. He's just doing his thing. And suddenly, all unbeknownst to everyone around him, he's got the memories, the powers, the abilities of a fifth generation Malky that's essentially been reincarnated. And now he's out to fulfill his agenda. You don't want that. No prince wants that in their domain. Nope. Now, I, w I wonder, uh, before before we move on to the insanity portion. Um, this whole thing wasn't insanity portion? Hey, this, is for, the pl this is for the players, okay? We have to have a whole thing on just arrangements, so hold on. The idea of, the idea of that, <laughs> uh, this, the idea of the elder being able to sort of leapfrog through time psychically into like a, a modern neonate, is that something that... That um, only Malka like I mean, who knows that like do only Malkavians know it? Is it rumor within the Camarilla? Because you said something about what prince would want something like that, but what if they don't even know that sort of possibility exists? Well, that's the thing. The Malkavians are insanity incarnated. It's just a matter of what's what's a prince not going to believe about a Malkavian really? Fair. Right. The leapfrogging through time. It's not the Malkavians spread rumor and misinformation, and some of them believe every bit of it, but. Even if it comes down to it, that theoretical fledgling, he might just have developed a new derangement and think he's Alexander the Great's Malkavian uh, vizier. Okay, well, fair enough. I just wanted to put that out there as information. Like, you know, is this something that you can or can't use with your character? You know, as we... that's the thing of it. 
it's always up to the enterprising player, and the Malkavians have fertile fields for the enterprising player. It's just what can you work into your game with your storyteller and your other players without making them want to kill both your character and you. That's a fine line, too, because that not wanting to kill your character or you is... With Malkavians, it's easy to do that. And we'll discuss a little bit later about crossing lines, but anytime you're wanting to try something out because you're like, this is cool and it's crazy, that's the key component. How disruptive is it going to be? Because there's a, you don't want to cross the line from being crazy to asshole. To be a Malkavian is to be insane. Sorry, that's it. Done. This, that's all it is. You, whether you realize it or not, you're nuts. Yeah, and to, no two insanities are ever the same. So among the clan, there's a whole variety of crazy. You pick a kind, it's there. That, But that's not to say that there aren't other kindred who aren't insane in their own right. There are many kindred and many clans who have their own insanities and their own crazy. Because just like humans, every one of us has things that may, we're weird about or we're, you know ticky tacky about but the Malkavians are different because they they cultivate they cultivate that insanity there is they delight in that insanity and in a way that no other clan does and they see that as a gift that's because there's an old saying among Malkavians when you find yourself falling into madness dive and people take a lot of different things from that personally I always took that as when you find that you can't control yourself any longer, look about you, and maybe you can find a way to harness it. However, another interpretation is when you find yourself falling into madness, embrace it wholeheartedly and just become this hedonistic lunatic. That's the one my wife took from it. Well, yeah, that's, that's actually that's a very interesting point. There, I think there's a Malkavian in Chicago that keeps an even keel by operating as a serial killer. Yeah, and you think about that. That's a little... He's trying to control his crazy by doing something that is crazy. You know, it, it, no two Malkavians are going to have the same kind of crazy. And so most Malkavians, they tend to lie on the spectrum of madness in different places. But if we can say there's a division between the Malkavians in terms of what their crazy is, there are, we can kind of sort of roughly divide it between quote unquote seers and quote unquote jokers. So people who have the gift of the oracular gift and people who just like to see the world burn. I don't see that as a division between Malkavians in general. It's a rough, it, it's, it, I, that's why I qualify that it's, it's very rough. And you, a Malkavian could be both at the same time. Or they can flip flop between the two because the seer, uh, I think, I think actually in the, our Pillars of Salt game, we've had both. We've had a full, like true seer. And then we've had the the uh, the Joker that was trying to sort of, as Logan, you you said it before, pull the wool away from our you know kindred eyes. Yeah, it, it we've had both, and we've even had Malkavians who were manifested kind of those rough and, and very rough aspects in themselves all at once. I, I should qualify here that this is the roughest of rough divisions. There is no, no Malkavian's ever going to be stuck in one role or the other. And often they'll be doing both at the same time or flip between the two. It's, it's, it's almost like an outsider's understanding of what, how Malkavian brains work. And because we aren't Malkavians and we don't get it, it's sort of, it's, it's like being an alien trying to explain why humans do the weird shit we do it's the same concept with the 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 seer and the joker buckets are not hard and fast buckets with the malkavians no that's that's another great uh player point to, to point out is that because we have those rough divisions and and the two sides seer versus joker it, it's it's really just sort of a I'll, I'll say it it's like a crutch for the player to be able to play it in a way that would be true to the clan because like you said because we're not malkavians we're we, we're not tapped into the madness network we don't have those voices 24 7 so the this is just a good way for a player to quantify what the motivation is for their character so when you're thinking seer i mean we're definitely talking like someone who can manifest visions what those visions are where they get the visions from what those visions look like 
who knows? It's products of their broken mind and products of whatever is trying to speak through them or to them or whatever within themselves is trying to say something about a situation going on. The Joker concept is much more of the Malkavian trying to change perceptions of the world. So they're tr- they're and usually they do this by tricking you. Like Logan was saying earlier, they're trying to pull the wool off your eyes. So it's this idea Reality of, of yeah, of tricking you into seeing the world in a different way. And so sometimes it could that could be a pretty benign situation, you know, maybe they're doing just a, a small little trick, a small little benign trick to make you see the world differently. Or it could be something that's absolutely sadistic and twisted, but it's making you think. Well, no two Malkavians are alike, and that means no two styles of the reality busting are alike, because there are some who just don't care. And I would want to say that the duality of the Joker and the Seer is a very rough starting point more than anything. Right, of course. I mean, as you play the character, you're going to find those nuances. And, you know, hopefully you're also going to be researching whatever your derangement is, because there's nuances to be found there as well, you know, in psychological journals, you know, what have you. That's absolutely right. And um, more than just wanting to be a sensitive portrayal of that, it's also a way, we go back to, it's a way to make the other players not want to strangle you. It's fine if they want to kill your character, less fine if they'd rather you just not come back. (laughs) Well, in light of that, with, you know, this discussion about jokes uh there is in that same vein is there a truly a time-honored tradition known as the prank among malkavians technically yes i just prefer the term reality busting because that's what the prank originally was it was let me show you how ridiculous this all is you think i'm a trickster and a jokester look at the trick you're all continuously playing on each other called society (laughs) because oh my god This is ridiculous. This is obnoxious, and we shouldn't be doing it. Follow me into the freedom of madness, friends, and let me show you how to live. Okay, so what is is the great prank? The great prank was actually a prank pulled on the Malkavians themselves. That was when they took their own clan discipline away from themselves, ostensibly to make the Ventru happy and join the Camarilla. Now, I say ostensibly because Malkavians don't do anything ever for anyone else for the most part. The Malkavians are very much, if they're not consciously following their crazy, it's subconscious. They've got a plan with that. Which is something always to keep in mind while playing a Malkavian. A thing to point out about the great prank, however, is that not only was this the removal of their particular clan gift, their particular discipline, away from them but it's no no Malkavian really understands it or understood why but in the 20th century late 20th century all of a sudden that great prank went away and it came back and not no one knows why so it lasted from the time that the Malkavians came into the Cambria until the 20th century and why it happened or for what purpose no one knows I mean theories range that maybe their discipline got taken away temporarily so until they could find safe footing in the world and could be accepted in the Camarilla maybe that's the case or maybe there's something bigger deeper darker going on in there no one knows for certain but for a period of like five six hundred years they didn't have access to the one discipline that defined them as Malkavians the Camarilla Camaria Malkavians did not, but you know who kept them? The Sabat. Mm-hmm. The Sabat Malkavians kept it. That's interesting. How would they be able to differentiate who got it and who didn't if they're if it's all the same blood? Who knows? Who knows? Malkov knows. No. Malkov knows. Who knows what madness lurks in the minds of Malkavians? Malkav knows. <laughs> no, he doesn't. <laughs> he saw it and ran. But beyond the great prank, which is the one that affected the entire clan, Malkavians affect pranks on each other. They affect pr- pranks on people outside. Some are bigger, some are smaller, some are more Machiavellian, if that if we could use that term. Than... Malkavian. <laughs> some are, are more Byzantine. Uh, 
Machiavelli and more complex than others. Um, there are pranks that some Malkavians will launch and they, you don't see ha the fruition of it for centuries, just like the great prank. And there are some that think the great prank was by Vasantasina herself. Uh, could be, who knows? But to believe that you'd have to be crazy. That's pretty much most Malkavians. So, okay, moving on. And with that, the, uh, the idea of the crazy talking about derangements. Yes, there is no such thing as a sane vamp as a sane well sane vampire. <laughs> there is no such thing as a sane Malkavian. There is abs there is no sane Malkavian. They there are some who maybe have insanity that's a little bit more manageable than others, um, or that they can fake being normal better than others. But even that may erode over time and centuries. Now, real quick, Jen, uh, as a mechanical note, what is a derangement in the world of darkness? So in the world of darkness, a derangement is a flaw that uh, any vampire can take. The Malkavians automatically have it. You can't get rid of it as a Malkavian. But any other clan can take a derangement as well. And this flaw essentially means that there is some, some mental tick you have, some mental... Uh, issue you have to a varying degree and it can depend on your character it depends on your story um, most people take don't take derangements lightly because a, der a derangement is a flaw that has a massive effect on your character and their and how you role play them so you can't just pretend if you have a derangement you can't pretend like yeah it's not there you have to role play it out some way even if you're faking if you're hiding it it's always there underneath the surface so um mechanically uh derangements are always going to be those things that that will inhibit you in one way or the other for example perhaps you have a derangement that um are uh you believe that you are a harbinger of the end times i picked that one because i had a malkavian who believed that that's it wasn't like every five minutes she was screaming at the top of her lungs beware for the end is nigh it, that that wasn't what she was doing but every action that character took and everything that she did she was always keenly aware that this may be feeding into some massive end game for the, the end of the world because that was her derangement it was what she was focused on so it's a flaw a derangement is a flaw that is your particular character's mental instability if you want to I hate using that word I hate using those descriptives but it's it's something about them uh, that is a mental instability and it affects them all at all the time and just like we've said before that no derangement can uh, derangements vary between Malkavians there are no two Malkavians that are alike and they they vary between vampires. You may have two vampires who have the same exact arrangement on paper, but it affects them very differently because of their backgrounds and who they are and what their backstory is. And it's the same with two individual Malkavians. You may have two Malkavians who are schizophrenic, but their schizophrenia manifests itself in different ways. Exactly. And I, I do love the idea that White Wolf has seen fit to sort of bring in the idea that it, if the embrace didn't grant the derangement, tip, you know, typically you already had something as a mortal that was underlying there and the embrace brought it out. And it could be anything from, you know, I mean, I, mean, I love the gamut. It's like you could have witnessed true horrors. It could be PTSD. It could be it could be an actual curse. That somebody levied on you. Yeah. It, it, it runs the gamut. It does. Now, it should be made very clear with the Malkavians that unlike other vampires, your madness is actually inherent in your blood as a Malkavian. You don't get to just opt out and say, psych, I don't have a derangement. No, all M Malkavians have a derangement. It's what makes them different as a clan. Because of that, they can't just like take a drug to inhibit it or use mind altering psychotherapy or there's nothing metaphysical that they can do. There's nothing pharmaceutical they can do. Um, there's nothing there. There's no way for them to really suppress that because it's part of what they are innately. Not entirely. There are ways to figure out the triggers. There are ways to work around it, but 
at the end of the day, the derangement will always come out. You are a moon-mad child of Malkov, and the curse will make itself known eventually, one way or another. Now, that's not to say that your character couldn't... I mean, this is just a cool plot twist that you could maybe try in a character if your character thinks they have it under control. Like, yeah, I'm feeding off of human, completely off of humans who are who are drugged up to the gills on Xanax. You know, you think it's under control, but that's all a mental illusion. None of it's ever under control, which could be a fun plot point for you. But at the end of the day, like you said, Logan, the madness is going to will out. You will never have control over it as a Malkavian. None of these things are to be taken lightly in playing a Malkavian. It's actually, in my opinion, quite a responsibility to play it and play it well. Playing it well is that underlining part. And the Malkavians themselves, they embrace people. Okay, the stereotype is that Malkavians will embrace people whose unique sight for the world, whose unique mind, unique way of thinking needs to be preserved for all time. In the same way that Toreador will embrace someone whose art needs to be preserved for all time as an artist. And in that, I mean, as we as we have said, this is a clan where they are they suffer from madness. And that suffer is kind of integral. Yeah, many Mulcavians may have suffered from mental illness as mortals, or some of them may not have done it at all, and it this is all new to them. It just came out after their embrace. But it should be stressed, this is a really a particular kind of horror. You know, they some they may see themselves as broken, others may not see themselves as broken or that anything's wrong. But this is something we should stress with Malkavians is this madness should not just be taken lightly. This is not something that's just silly or flip it. This isn't fun. This is like living in a horror story every night. Even ones who delight in it should be played with such panache as to make it clear that they may delight in it, but that's because that delight is also part of the madness. It's part of their suffering. This person is wrong. This person's way of thinking should not be. It is against society, against their own interests. It is abomination. But when it comes to Malkavians, it's, um, they are, they are depressing. They are sad. They are called the double damned for a reason, because what is more sad, what is more terrifying, what is more horrifying to know, to know with absolute certainty that you can't trust your own brain. You can't trust what you see, what you hear, what you think. How horrible is that? Yeah. Right. Well, and with that, um, I know you touched on it before, Logan, the, the fish mulk. This <laughs> is something that is, is a detriment to, to most players and to the game and to the clan. Uh, speaking of stereotypes, uh, why, don't you, why don't you go ahead and fill us in on, on what is this a fish malt. Okay, a fish malt is a problem. It is an abomination Amen. even by Malkavian standards and by Malkavian player standards. These are the ones who ruin it for everyone who wants to play a Malkavian. The fish malt, well, the term comes from way back in, I believe, a Dark Ages rule book where there is a Malkavian who was holding and caressing a fish. No particular reason, just, hey, isn't this funny? And that's the problem. It's because these are the kinds of Malkavians that are played by people who want it to be funny. They're playing Daffy Duck. They're playing, oh, look at me, I'm crazy, I can do what I want. Look, I'm going to make a table talk in the corner. How fun is that? Look, I'm going to be an ass and be really disruptive in the game. At the end of the day, these are the ones that every vampire storyteller has horror stories about. Like, I'm sure you two, between the two of you, have more than a few. Yep. <laughs> Oh, yeah. When I first said Malkavian, both of you had that little shudder, which is appropriate, but shouldn't be. It, it's sort of a sad statement. The fish milk is a part of, of tabletop and LARP lore. Many a storyteller has that shudder of like, oh, God. Most of them. I've known many who will not allow them in their games anymore, and that's a shame. Because they're people who just... Okay, I'm going to be nice about this and say they are people played... They are people who played them who were not suited to their temperament. They used them for comic relief. They used them because they've got a built-in asshole mechanic, a built-in get-out-of-jail-free card. Uh, oh, pff, it's just me playing my character. I'm crazy, after all. Yeah, I pants the prince, but I'm a Malkavian. They're going to let me get away with it. No, your ass is going out on the dawn, friend. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you're right, Logan. I mean, the, the Malkavians are not a clan of wacko comedians. 
they are in modern psychological parlance we would say they have a mental condition and every one of them reacts just a little differently to it it's not a license for you to be obnoxious or childish or silly just because you want to be let your inner asshole out that said i mean it's not that there aren't malkavians who can't be any oh. one of those things at any one particular point in time they could be hilarious, but you need to at least need to kind of suppress a little either shudder or <laughs> vomit. Um, because while they're being cutesy, while they're playing with dolls and feeding them tea, that tea needs to be made of the blood of the innocents who are strung up on their ceilings. Like, um, I'm trying to think of some examples. Uh, Pennywise, he's the first one that pops to mind. He's a killer crown. He's crazy. He's occasionally hilarious, but you also know that this is a freaking monster. Um, uh, oh, oh, what was her name on, um, uh, Buffy, uh, Drusilla. Drusilla, yeah. She is was an example of that tea drinking crazy, the cutesy kind. Yeah, she was cutesy, but she was terrifying. Um, you need to be thinking about playing the mentally deranged, not, not a cartoon. That does you a disservice, that does everyone a disservice, and again, everyone else is going to not only hate your character, they're going to start hating you. Moreover, they're going to start hating the clan, and that screws it up for the rest of us. So many times, I have not been able to play a Malkavian because the last guy screwed it up for everyone. And I'm pissed. <laughs> well, w w on that, I w I, you know, well said. I want to say, uh, as again, another player note, that we, uh, we've said it before in this little section here, that... You know, go ahead and and say it, Logan. Do go ahead and say the i the the thing is that if if you can't handle this clan, maybe you shouldn't play it. You know, be honest no, with yourself. Absolutely. If you can't do it and do it well, don't fucking do it because you're gonna screw it up for the rest of us. It's not being exclusionary. It's trying to. Everyone has strengths and weaknesses, and some people are actually crazy, and some of those people shouldn't be playing because, well, they go a little deeper into it, and it can be a very bad time for everyone. But some people, playing a Malkavian can be a fun outlet for other parts of themselves. And some people have the temperament to play crazy and play crazy well. A lot of people just don't. And that's just a matter of everyone has different strengths and weaknesses. There are a bunch of other clans, and if you want... A Malkavian light, there are anyone can have derangements. On that note, and to piggyback on that, is a whole other issue of this being a clan, like you said, Logan, that is difficult to play and is a clan of, of people who have mental illnesses. So, we as storytellers, we ourselves want to urge people to have a certain sensitivity about this. Like you said, Logan, it's not a clan for the faint of heart. Uh, but I think one of the things that uh, over the years, as I've seen many concepts come and go, the one thing we don't want to have happen is people to caricature real mental illness. Because it, mental illness is, is a problem. It's a heartbreaking problem. And it, it affects millions of people in just this country and millions all over the world. And we recognize that any storyteller with their salt will recognize that so we don't want players who are just going to come in here and be, make it a, a caricature of mental illness that said this is a clan that's that can offer a lot of options on how to explore different ways of perceiving the world and the state of being a vampire and of the beast you know it's it's a clan that allows you these avenues that can give you uh, a more, more twisted, a more twisted perspective of a vampiric existence than say other vampires could have. Um, but this this can be a trigger heavy clan. I think Malkavian, more than many other clans, is trigger heavy because you are dealing with some very dark themes in Clan Malkavian. Um, and some very real situations that for many people, they could be living with in real life every day. You know, you could be playing a character who has autism while there's another player in game who's on the spectrum. And that's their real life existence day to day. You don't want to make light of that. Um, you know, you don't want to make light of depression or anxiety or those things that, you know, many of the people around you probably have to have had to deal with if not themselves they've had to watch loved ones deal with it so i just want to urge as a storyteller myself i want to urge just sensitivity in these topics as you're dealing with them because 
this is a community. We've said it before in other episodes. This is a community. We want to build that community and not alienate anyone, but still create a space where people can explore in these areas and explore different avenues and aspects and just remember this is this is about being fun and creative it is not about turning anyone's particular life into a caricature we're going to change gears a little on a on a little lighter note and talk about the abilities of the Malkavians. i think this touches into what we've been talking about alluding to their their signature power the the Malkavians' madness gives them an uncanny ability to use their dark gifts to manipulate the cracks in the minds of others. And this ability has become known as dementation. Because obviously it's demons. De- I, this, well, it's not spelt the same, but you're right. You're not wrong. I'm just saying, if it's in the Dark Ages, we all know it was demons. That's right. Demons and demon taint. Dementation. Yes. So if you can, if you could think of a more terrifying discipline, I dare you. Because... Dementation is an absolutely terrifying discipline when it's applied against others. Well, vicissitude's got a good foothold for a runner-up, but that's only changing your body, you know. It's this is fucking with things, someone's brain. Yeah. Cutting things off. It's, you know, melding you to other people. Kid stuff. This does that to your brain. This yeah. makes you look at your children and decide, boy, they look tasty. This makes you look over the edge of a building and think that looks like some nice cool lake water down there that's actually pavement yeah i mean used in small measure demon take can just control another person's emotions you know which might be good if they're frenzying in the middle of court but if you are turning out full force on a target it can blow them into full-on insanity you can ruin another character with it on its surface, dementate is dementation is not. It, it, you're like, oh, you know, messing with someone's emotions, that's fine. But if you really pay attention and you really know how to use it, I mean, the thing is a scalpel. It, it's not a sledgehammer. It is definitely a scalpel. I've seen it used as a sledgehammer, and we had one of those. Uh, actually, it was a borderline fish malk moment. Um, well, suffice to say, there was someone naked and. People got slapped with some body parts that weren't hands. Oh, dear. Okay. Well, and that can happen, too. That ended up being terrifying, but not for any reason that you might suspect, but that's a story for another day. It should be underscored here that dementation is not a fun or silly discipline. You were bringing up, like, this was borderline fish milk. Dementation is not a silly discipline, and it's not about being silly though you can make someone look very silly indeed if you choose to when using it it can be a very terrifying uh it can be a very terrifying discipline you know if you use it correctly it it it's scary what it can do uh you can bring a city to its knees if you use it on the prince at the right time yeah yeah you know apply that you, if you want to apply that to the power structure of any given city that it, that could bring the entire thing to its knees. And it is this fear of the discipline that many of empiric scholars believe was at the heart of what we've we've talked about, the great prank. Pranks, as we mentioned, are the time-honored tradition of the Malkavians, but the great prank began once the Malkavians had come into the Camarilla, as, as uh, you know, we mentioned before. Yes, the great prank, which was, of course, when the Malkavians fooled everyone else into believing that dementation was gone forever. Right, right. They somehow blocked it, blocked the ability, quote unquote, from the Camarilla. Blocked Camarium it Arcadia. from the entire Camarilla. But Forever. Yeah. And totally not just until you've forgotten how terrible it is and it can reemerge to just completely obliterate everyone. Yeah. I mean, we've already talked about the Great pr- Prank, but I mean, when you think about it, the the idea of th- that it just, quote unquote, disappeared for centuries, it it makes you wonder, first of all, just how terrifying dementation was before the Malkavians entered into the Camarilla because, you know, they felt they needed to hide it just to come in. So that's a scary proposition. And I don't know who they is. They could have been the Camarilla. I have two questions the for you in this regard. Who do you think started the Inquisition and how? <laughs> yeah, that's a theory. That's For that a... matter, who do you think started the idea of organized religion and how? Also a theory. The Pope gets voices in his head from God. Mm-hmm. Tell that to the Malkavian. 
I will say nothing being a student of religious studies and and Christian history, but I won't dispute it. <laughs> of course, this is within the confines of the game world itself, not actual anything else. Of course. And just as a side note, for whatever reason, instead of having the demon Tate uh, discipline among the Camarilla Malkavians, they used the dominate discipline in its place. And, and I guess that was more socially acceptable. I mean, it has kind of the same feel because it's still mental. You're still pushing your will on others. And, you know, the Ben True and Tremere have it, so it must be good fun. And I want to point out something. How terrifying is it that the less scary option was for the clan of crazy people to be able to forcefully control your mind? That was considered the better option. <laughs> it's something they could understand. I mean, that's that's the only other thing I can think of. You know, it's like, oh, we, we, we understand Dominate. Yeah, you guys can cultivate that. How much you want to bet it wasn't ever Dominate in the first place? Maybe it was just really demon tate and they were just saying it was dominate i'm just throwing that crazy tinfoil hat theory out there you know what i'm sure white wolf's gonna have some kind of retcon errata about that coming up soon <laughs> go full art bell on this just put that tinfoil that's hat right on. exactly <laughs> well you want to go full tinfoil hat i'll ask another question what makes what makes you think that it wasn't the malkavians who decided dominate was the discipline and they just used their abilities to convince everyone else around them that's what they wanted. You know, that's a great, great point, because that's the thing with the great prank. Nobody really understands why why they did it or why they tell people they did it. Like the uh, the Ventru, the Tremere, the Toreador, they all thought the, ter the Malkavians were getting celerity until they had a conversation and they realized, yeah, Dominate was better. Wait, why did that come out of my mouth? Why did I have that idea? <laughs> In retrospect, this team's terrible. Oh, wait, it's already done. Hell. Long and the short is... For a period of centuries, the Cambria Malkavians did not use Demon Tate openly. This all changed, though, in, during a period called the Week of Nightmares. Um, this happened in the late 1990s. No one's really clear on what happened, but the Malkavians, amongst the many things that happened, and there was a whole boatload of weirdness that happened during that time period, one of the things was that the Malkavians suddenly and mysteriously got Demon Tate back. And there are some who actually did not, or at least chose not to, to take it back. And those Malkavians still use Dominate instead of Demon Tate. They have arrangements just like all the other Malkavians, um, but often the, the Dominate Malkavians tend to have much more internalized derangements than the Demon Tate Malkavians do. And in um, game terms, they're called the Knights of the Moon that you can take. And in the uh, By Night Studios rules, there's a merit that allows you to play one of these. So if you want to touch the Malkavians, but you don't want to go like full on nuts, you can be a little bit more internalized with your crazy and just be a dom dominate wielder. It's not that they're any less crazy. It's that they've realized different ways of controlling it. When it comes out, it still comes out. They are still Malkavians. Uh, uh, definitely. I'm just talking about from the player perspective. If they, if there's like, if there's any section in the Malkavian to dip your toe in, that would be it. Also, it's another way of saying that you might be able to convince a storyteller to let you play a Knight of the Moon. I'm easy to convince. Yeah, and th that, again, that's why we always say talk to your storytellers. It's the number one rule. Number one yes. rule. Always talk to your storyteller. I thought the number one rule was don't touch. <laughs> well, yes. The okay. number one rule is don't touch. The number two that rule is... That is absolutely the number one rule. The number two rule is don't be an asshole. And the number three rule is talk to your storyteller. That's right. Okay. So, Jen, here, here it comes. This is my favorite part. <laughs> yeah. So, I like crazy. Do you like crazy? Because I so love crazy. How do I play a Mulcavian? Well, it's simple. <laughs> you pick a derangement and you go completely crazy. You ignore everyone around you. You force yourself into every scene possible and get as close to each other as humanly possible, being as disruptive as possible. And second, th secondly, disregard everything Logan just said. <laughs> Absolutely. That will get you banned from almost any game and with good reason. That's right. My number one piece of advice in actuality for this is don't start with the derangement. Don't start with that. Start with the character. And as you're building your character, 
Let the derangement flow naturally from their personality. Think about the questions, were they insane in life? Is the change itself, the embrace, what did it magically? Is their sire one who decided that this person needs broken and made the embrace as difficult as humanly possible? And let the derangement flow from that. You'll find out pretty quick that a lot of them are not the easier to abuse ones like schizophrenia or multiple personality disorder, disassociative identity disorder now. Um, a lot more often you're going to find sociopathy, you're going to find some borderlines, depressions, obsessions, you're going to find delusions of grandeur, you're going to find um, solipsism, you're going to find some really good ones, some really within the context of this conversation and the game, fun ones, because again, these are not fun. These are not things you want in real life. But within a game, as a character study, yeah, it can be an interesting thought exercise. Malkavians can be rather tough to play, and they're completely broken as individuals, and no two derangements are alike. We've said that you can have two schizophrenics, but it manifests completely differently. And this is where you get to be creative in how you approach that character, uh, depending on, like Logan said, that's a great piece of advice. When you're building out the character, figure out what they did and how, where, and, and if they did not have a derangement in life, after the embrace, how did it manifest because of what their profession is or their lifestyle or their family you know what their experiences are just because you see visions doesn't mean that you see the same ones as everybody else exactly mulcavians don't have to be silly just yeah. keep that in mind you don't have to have a silly mulcavian they don't have to run around in sparkly tights and fairy wings to be a mulcavian they could qu look fairly quote-unquote normal that doesn't make them normal but they could look that way you it's it's completely up to your character and how they're manifesting themselves and you can act and interact with people in perfectly reasonable ways all evening you're always adhering to your character's own slightly bent understanding and worldview i mean the choice is yours i i really think like one of my favorite uh concepts i've seen of late is i've been reading beckett's jihad diary which if you haven't read beckett's jihad diary go read it but in there, he, he's in dialogue with a character, a Malkavian, who he interacts with everyone perfectly normally, but he sees the world as if it's like a movie or a television show. So when Johan. He's, yeah, so whenever he's recounting uh, an event, he recounts it as a screenplay. And it's a delight to read in many ways because... He interacts just fine with everybody, but there's a part of his brain that believes he's watching a television show or a movie, and it's unsettling, and it's creepy, and kind of weirdly wonderful. But that's an example of someone who has got kind of a weird offbeat derangement, but it's not played for laughs. It's played as if he's this is just him and how he operates in society and remember that because of their unique insights again they can they can come from any walk of life the Malkavians run the gamut from pr prophets and priests to those in the mental health profession ment with mental health issues charismatic leaders respected individuals with unique perspective like you said that was it was it johan 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 a unique perspective of the world i mean clearly that's not how reality is i guess but he views it that way it's like a like a giant uh, vr simulation as they i think would be the modern part would be a different malkavian a di <laughs> okay so they see there you go there's a wholly other different malkavian i see my personal favorite thing about how he understood the world was i think he secretly ships beckett and jan peter Zune, and i'm all in on that ship so that is I'm, hilarious. That's so not that's terrible. That is, I a, that think is either great. one of them would be into that. Beckett doesn't have time, and Jan's just no. I think it's funny, but it's a Malkavian perspective. Okay, if we're gonna get into Malkavian perspectives, we will be here all night because I'll start breaking out old characters. All right, I got binders full of them. No, we still got to get to the concepts. But <laughs> all that being said, is Malkavians do have see the world from their own weirdly dark broken perspective and this gives them insight into the world that no one else has um, and that no other clans really can understand and I think that's the paramount that's the paramount key to 
what it means to play a Malkavian is that you are, no one else is going to quite understand the way that you understand the world. You know, that does lead into our concept section. But I think with that, with these concepts, we're going to give you some really good ideas on what that means. That that shifted perspective, that twisted perspective. So first, it, first would be my one of my favorites, the detective, because let's face it, every iteration of Sherlock Holmes is a is off kilter. Every one of them. They're, every one. Sherlock Holmes, and no matter how he he or she, sometimes it's a she. Now, no matter how that concept is portrayed, they ain't right in the head, and it's that. And it varies. It could be their, you know, OCD or their sociopathic or all of the above. It's the idea that 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 twisted way they have of seeing the world gives them the ability to look at facts in different ways that helps them understand or give insight into or perceive things that other people do not so i mean classic examples like adrian monk or columbo um you know those of you who are old enough to know who columbo is or you know even uh dr house these are all different plays on that same sherlock holmes trope they are all versions of sherlock holmes but it's the idea of whatever their cracked geniuses it allows them to see things in different ways that allows them to figure out problems that no one else can and next we have the offbeat outsider i, I love how you put in here that it uh, donnie darko is your first example yeah i i, I love that movie but it's the, it's that it's that weird kid it's the one that you know it it just doesn't fit in. Maybe they're ha- they have visions of the end of the world, or maybe they're more like Christian Slater's character in Heather's, where they're, you know, a psychopath who just on occasion lashes out in violence, but doesn't understand why, you know, people don't understand why no one else is horrified by this. It's you. These are outsiders who are who are trying to fit in with the rest of the world. And sometimes they succeed until their derangement kind of gets the better of them. And then it's not okay. And they can't figure out how to make it better. The same concept can be applied to someone from almost any kind of supernatural show imaginable. It could also be applied to Buffy, who believes that she's fighting vampires. And in reality, she's not. Well, you know, that's interesting you put that, you say that, because every one of those supernatural shows has that one episode. Episode. And I remember the one from Buffy. Yeah, that, that they wake up and they're in a mental hospital. And it's like, this isn't all, this isn't real. None of this is real. And you're like, well, wait a minute. Yes, it is. I just killed a van, dusted a guy last night. Yeah, he was a father of four. Good job. Right. So, yeah, definitely has, that. You good, yeah, that's a good one. They got that trope in there. American Gods. Uh, Shadow. Could be a Malkavian. Gods are talking to him. He just, he finds this out after his wife is dead. And I can't say more, otherwise I'd spoil one of the greatest shows in history. But I read the book. I've read the book so many times, but he finds this out after his, he's had this traumatic experience with his wife. And, oh, his wife's alive again. It's almost like things didn't happen. And there, that's all I'm going to say. And next we have the control freak. This, I guess, goes in under the OCD uh, title it could be ocd or they could just be a control freak but yeah, it could be as mild as like sheldon from the big bang theory or as wide ranging as say emperor palpatine from star wars you know it's this idea that everything has to fit in a particular order and if it doesn't then you need to force it into fitting into that particular order there needs to be order in the universe uh whether it's your universe or everyone else's universe yeah that's kind of up to you and your derangement um, but it's an obsess- obsession with making everything fit into a pattern that only really you can see or understand. Yeah, I love how that's scaled because it could be as simple as, you know, all the blue Legos go here and all the red ones go here and to the nth degree of, no, those planets are all mine. Uh, but it's this idea of you have a vision for the way the world works and you're going to make it work. Or else. But it could just be your vision right now jen you have here the winter soldier well I, that's kind of interesting to me what 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 was your reasoning with that my my reasoning with that besides my 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 undying <laughs> obsession and affection for bucky barnes it's actually um the winter soldier 
is not a is not a Marvel concept. I hate to tell you guys this. It's actually a reference to Vietnam veterans that got left behind. And it kind of has come to in many ways embody this idea of of soldiers who even when they came home, they didn't quite come home. So that could be a Bucky Barnes or a Rambo. I think Rambo is actually the much the better example of this. It's the idea. Book or film Rambo? Um, I've only ever seen film Ram- Rambo, so I'm going to go film. Book Rambo is a better example. He's um, He gleefully kills people and justifies it the entire way. I think more than the, the gleefully killing of people, it's the idea that you've experienced a trauma and you've seen things that have affected you so deeply and so profoundly and no matter what you can't you no matter how hard you try to fit back into society you can't and so there's a large part of you that it it's just never going to fit in and so you don't know how to make all these pieces work you try and you just can't so it's it's much more um tapped into that experience of of many people who have been through traumas and it doesn't even have to be a like a Vietnam war or an Afghanistan it could be people who have survived uh, horrible trauma say ch- something as horrific as child abuse or have seen murders or maybe they grew up in a gang infested drug infested neighborhood and they saw things but it's that concept of whatever you've been through you know ne- you didn't come out of that a whole person that's actually a great concept. Uh, next, we have the master manipulator. It, yeah, you're brilliant and you know it. You like playing games and you play games to win. And you can control everything. You can control the media. You can control the government, the politics, and you do it all with a smile. All the while, you're weaving your little schemes to control everything because it's yours. Um, you don't have a lot of room for empathy for people in, in, in as you grasp for power Um, These are going to be Malkavians who are probably going to be the most political Malkavians because they play the game scarily well and they have absolutely zero empathy and zero qualms. So think of like Frank Underwood from House of Cards or, you know, any other particularly bloodthirsty political animal. But I think Frank Underwood's one of the prime examples I think of because it's he's like means to an end type of guy and it doesn't have a lot of qualms about it and this episode's game of thrones reference i wasn't gonna do it i was gonna be good no 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 it's a thing now and we're gonna do it cersei lannister that's right cersei lannister what if you don't um watch that show then what's wrong with you yeah i'm a malkavian (laughs) wow wow i'm gonna use that Anytime somebody <laughs> says, what is wrong with you? Um, I'm Malkavian. Malkavian. <laughs> All right. Next is the the only sane one left. This sounds really, really interesting. It's the idea that this what, what is it? The, the world's crazy. I'm the only one that knows what's really going on. I love that idea. Just starting from that simple idea, this can be this one character can go dozens of different directions. Absolutely. They can become the hero. They can become the worst villain because, oh, my God, you all don't see it. You don't see how horrible you are. I mean, you think about most of the supervillains in comic books, that's what they are. They see themselves as being the only sane ones left. You know, they are the ones who know that the world is broken and that they, are the, they have the key to fix it. You know, the obvious one is the Joker, and you've got others in there like Black Manta, who, no wait, uh, Ocean Master, who thinks he's the only one who can, can, should control the sea, and Superman, of course, the worst supervillain ever. <laughs> Moving on... <laughs> Oh, he's Logan. an alien who decides that you are going to live because he has decided that you should live and it fits into his moral code. So screw yours. I can oh, get on board boy. with this. That Yeah, that's some great logic right there. Last but not least, the Dr. Freud. Yeah, so the Dr. Freud is you yourself know so much about mental health. You make a study of it. Um, after all, nobody knows crazy better than someone who themselves is crazy. So it could be anyone who's in that field maybe you're a psychologist maybe you're a psychiatrist maybe you uh work you run a mental health facility or you're a clinical researcher or what have you you know crazy and because you know crazy 
you can interact with crazy in ways and deeply fundamental ways that the average person cannot. It's not going to touch you. You're going to be safe. Or, hey, I know how to manipulate it in a way that best suits me. Those who lie down with Malkavians get up with derangements. Actually, can I add another one here? Sure. Yeah. I call it the imposter because it's a Malkavian who is so convinced of their own thing that they come off as a different clan. A Malkavian with anger issues who thinks they're a bruja. A Malkavian with such a refined palate that they act like a Ventru. It's possible. Possible. It, it would definitely be creepy for many, many a clan. They would have some serious issues with that. Not that I've been thinking about this in reference to any particular game or anything. No, not at all. If I see that come across my desk, Logan. Okay, moving on. The pop culture section. Uh, with the Dr. Freud being right there, I, I think that this first section of... Uh, this is the section, if you don't know, where we find things within popular culture that are examples of the clan that we are discussing. Or things that are great reference points for you to kind of draw some ideas from. So the first one being, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Yes. I mean, like, this is a classic movie about mental health facilities in the tw mid-20th century. And those and people who have different perspectives of life. I feel like it's a, just a classic movie about mental health and how it was treated in the mid-20th century. But if you're playing a Malkavian, I really recommend watching this, this movie because I think it gives you a, an insight into that, like, twisted playful nature but also the the tragic sadness of what it means to not just have mental health issues but to be anyone who is just different and for all of you those of you who have ever heard the reference nurse ratchet this is where it comes from yep and the next we have the dark knight which of course yes the knew, joker the joker we knew it was coming i mean i think any iteration of the joker no matter well one well, disagrees. I, I'm like, maybe not the 60s one, but then maybe the 60s one. I don't know. The well, 60s well. one is fine. Suicide Squad is not. Oh, yeah. Suicide Squad. I have to own. I didn't see Suicide Squad, so I didn't even think of that one. And there should be obvious reasons why I didn't see Suicide Squad. But, um, every, but every other iteration of Joker, I think, is a particularly good good kind of thing to draw from but of course i feel like the best one is heath ledger's because he has such a twisted worldview and I, I i think it's a good example of how derangements work he's the most grounded in reality because his universe is the most grounded in reality and every time he you see him every iteration of of the joker on screen kind of exhibits a different psychosis Mm -hmm. Even as much as I don't like it, the Suicide Squad Joker does, in fact, work as a Malkavian. He's just the worst kind of fish mulk. Yeah. I definitely got... I'm sorry. After see, I did see that one, and even though I enjoyed Jared Leto's portrayal, if you're running around in a... In a I mean, it's the Joker mobile, let's be honest. That That's fish mulk. <laughs> You know, when you're when you've got the purple car in, and you're having you're running around the streets of Gotham, you know, killing innocent bystanders, that's fish milk. Yeah. And that's your date night. And that's your date night, fish milk. Could be a Sabat one, but I think the purple car is a little flashy for a Sabat. Oh no, Maybe that's perfectly Sabat. No, that is perfectly Sabat. I'm here, I'm proud, I'm a vampire. What the fuck are you gonna do about it? Okay, so we'll we'll say that Joker in Suicide Squad is a Sabat Malkavian. Well, 1960s Joker is much more than Mal look, you can't read a Malkavian. <laughs> yeah. He's a jolly fellow. And Heath Ledger's Malkavian is just, I want to see the world burn. So. <laughs> right. Which could, which could be both. Could be could both. Be either. Could go either way there. I was going to say another, a, another pop culture reference. Pick a quirky detective. Just pick one. It could be Holmes. It could be Fox Mulder. It could be Monk. It could be House. It could be, uh, it could be the Mentalist. It could be Psych. It could be what have you. Pick a, a quirky detective on television. That's a that's a great thing to draw from. Obsessive awareness would be a hell of a de uh, derangement. Yeah. You see and remember everything. Oh, that'd be a pain to role play though. Well, I don't know. Give them. Pain to role plays can be challenging, can be... Uh... Can be challenging, but it's that cracked perspective that gives you insight that most others don't. Okay, and now Fight Club. Yeah, that's enough said. 
I mean, that whole movie is a Mulcavian movie. Need we say more with Fight Club? Anyone who's seen it knows. Anyone who hasn't isn't going to get it. That's yeah. true. That's true. Because we, we all know the first rule is don't speak about Fight Club. So, uh. <laughs> Hey, you're following arbitrary rules now. That means my Malkavian madness is spreading. <laughs> oh, it's um, an infection. Uh, the last one I put on this list is a movie. I don't know if either one of you saw this movie, but I saw it. Um, and it's Noah. And it's uh, the Russell Crowe movie from, uh, when it's 2013 or 14. But this is a great movie for anybody who wants to play a seer Malkavian. It's the idea that God is speaking, but is it that you're hearing the voice of the divine or are you hearing the voice of your own personal madness? hard to say it's a Dar- danny aronofsky movie so that should t- tell you right there what this this movie is all about daring concept and one that sounds oddly familiar to me for some reason <laughs> and not danny it's darren isn't it darren, darren aronofsky, aronofsky yeah no yeah. i like i like him i should see that i haven't seen yeah. it yet uh it's a darren aronofsky movie it fits right into his vein of of like weird conceptual movies playing with perspective and, and sanity. I, I frankly, go see any Darren Aronofsky movie if you want to play a Malkavian. But this one in particular, Noah, I think really hits on the idea of the seer. Of it, are, are you really channeling the voice of the divine or are you just crazy? I think another good movie for this is also there's um, Joan of Arc. Uh, I'm trying to remember who all was in it. I know Dustin Hoffman was in the particular version I'm thinking of. Is that the one with Lily Lee Sobieski? Yeah. Oh, no, the, that was the made-for-TV one, right? Possibly. I it, It's been 15 years since I saw it. But but it's the same yeah, idea. Yeah, it's the same idea of someone who, you know, she's, where she's speaking with the voice of the divine, but everyone else thinks she's crazy. And the way the film works, it makes you wonder who's right in that. So those are great concepts, I think, for the steers, because... It, it, there is supposed to be a sort of madness that makes you wonder, is this really the divine or is this just insanity? Who knows? And another one, um, if I can add one more, is think about the ending of The Craft. I forget the ending of The Craft. It's oh, we're, yeah, we're, but I yeah, I could see that because it could be somebody that thought they had great mystical power and then it was robbed from them. That's why I said the ending and not the entire right. thing. But then, but then you would have to say that that character was embraced and then, you know, escaped. But that's a good one, though. I like that the idea of, like, I had everything and now I have nothing. Think about all the role play opportunities to step, tell about the time you were God. I walked on water. No, really. I can fly. I made a monkey crawl out of someone's ass. Oh, wait. Wrong, wrong movie. movie. All right. And now we have the, the books to read. This is all the canonical information that we provide you. Yeah. So, I mean, we always tell you. Clan books. Always go reference those. Absolutely, no matter what clan you're playing. Um, Limbella Sanguinis IV is the book. It's called Thieves of the Night. It is the Dark Ages book that discusses Malkavians in the Dark Ages. So go check that out. Veil of the Night, which deals with the Dark Ages Ashira Courts. Also, great perspective of Malkavians. I like their perspective of Malkavians, actually, because it's a Muslim worldview of of insanity, especially a, a Muslim world, Dark Ages Muslim world perspective, because it's the idea of Allah has has told you to take care of the sick, the infirmed, and the, and the insane. So they're treated with a certain reverence and respect that you don't see in the European Dark Ages because they're like, oh, God, demons, ah! You know, it could be demons or maybe God, maybe all is speaking through them. Hard to tell. And then there's Time of Thin Blood. This shows how the Malkavians work into the prophesied end times and their role they play in Gehenna. Uh, yeah, the time of thin blood. If you want to see how what the role that Malkavians can play in the modern nights, go read this book, because they see that the fix is in long before anybody else does. Oh yeah, it's actually a good read. I, I really enjoyed it. It also provides um, stats for Mal- for insight, although that's really more for ostensibly it's for thin bloods, but or is it? I think it's just thin blood. Thin bloods. Okay, yeah, but it's uh, mechanical stats for making Malkavian insight easy to use. Yeah. 
Right. A lot of inspiration can be found there. And then last but not least, the Book of Nod itself. Which, you know, for those of you who aren't as up and up on your deep, deep dive White Wolf lore, the Book of Nod is kind of, sort of, maybe if you squint and look at it sideways, um, a, a vampire Bible, but less a Bible. It's much more of their vampiric Genesis story. If we're, if you just took the Book of Genesis and turned it into a story vampires tell about their own creation and existence. That's what the Book of Nod is. Without diving too much into the Sabbat and what they use the Book of Nod for. Honestly, when you look at some versions of the Book of Nod, De Laurent's uh, Book of Nod, for example, you can see Clam Alcavian's dirty little fingers all over it with, you know, there's prophecy, there's insight, there's madness. There's there's a lot of Malkavian all over the Book of Nod. I always thought of the Book of Nod as sort of a vampiric koji, which is the Japanese history, but it's very... It ties in things that other cultures would find fanciful or mythological. Or it, or it may not be. Who knows? Ah, the mysteries abound. If you're ruling myth out entirely, you're the crazy one. I'm just saying, it's Vampire the Masquerade. I rule nothing out entirely. That's a good idea. On that note, I think we've we've definitely done a good good amount of deep dive into the clan Malkavian. Oh uh, yeah, I think I have dived as deep into the crazy as I'm willing to go diving into. But there's more. Come on, come. No, no, yeah. no, no. I gotta I gotta stick some um, Clorox in my ears so I can wash the brain out. No, no, come on, come deeper. If you come deeper, you don't have like to come with me anymore. I like waiting in my own personal crazy over here, Logan. I don't need to go <laughs> wait in anybody else's personal crazy. All right. Well, thank you all for joining us. I really hope that you got a lot out of this. Um, as always, Logan, thank you. I, I do find your insights very, very entertaining and thought-provoking. Thank you. That's what I hope for. And I'm glad we got to have you on board because I know this is your favorite clan and you spoke into it beautifully. Thank you so much. It is. I got to talk about a lot of things that I love and I got to play a little because I like delving into the uh, character even in a meta sense. But if I can leave one thing, it is rehashing that. Don't be disruptive if you're going to be a Malkavian. You're going to screw it up for the rest of us. You're going to do yourself a disservice. You're going to make yourself not have as much fun as you could, and you're going to ruin it for everyone else. Right. Well put. All right. Well, and with that, I have been John Long. I'm Jennifer Wolf. I'm Logan, and I had so much fun, I think I'm going to stick around a little while. Oh, yes. That reminds me. We're going to be discussing um, the clan Nosferatu next, when Logan will be joining us again. <laughs> and that was totally their idea. It was. It was. Yeah, you can blame us. We will be talking into your ears very soon. Bye. 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 And if you want to get a hold of us outside of our normal podcast hours, you can find us at Podcast by Night on Facebook. You can also find us on Twitter at By Night Podcast, or you can email us with any questions, thoughts, uh, opinions, you know, anything you want to communicate to us. You can do that at Podcast by Night at gmail.com.